Let me start by just introducing us. I'm Scott Young. I'm a partner in the Salt Lake City office of Mayor Brown, and I'm so excited to be here today with my partner from Los Angeles, Dominique Shelton Leipzig. Thank you so much for coming to join us today, Dominique. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, can I start by just asking this group a quick question, and that is, how are we all doing on our data privacy compliance? I'm going to ask it maybe on a scale of, let's say, one to three. One meaning you haven't done anything, and hopefully people are willing to be honest here. <laughs> We're but if, it, on, <laughs> if it's a one, you haven't really started. A two, you're making good progress. And three, you're all the way there. Well, it's his lawyer. I have to advise him not to answer. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to watch his answer in particular, but who, who feels like they're still at a one? Anybody willing to admit that? Okay, we've got a good group here. Who's at a two? Okay, and, and who's all the way there? Okay, most of us are not answering, so, okay. Well, great. Well, let's get started. We're he um, so I think we've got probably a pretty sophisticated group here. And um, I was also going to say, Dominique, that it's amazing what people will do for a free lunch. They'll come out and watch us. But, well, let me, Dominique, I'm going to turn over to you to talk about our agenda. And go next slide. What is that? Are we on the karaoke? No? Okay. We are not going to do karaoke. Well, you know, while we're waiting for the slides to come up, we want to make this really practical for all of you um, because there's so much going on just around the US and then globally, uh, about 150 countries with data protection laws. We imagine you are ingesting quite a bit. So um, Scott's going to give you an overview of the Utah Consumer Privacy Act. Um, then we'll both kind of back and forth discuss how this compares with other state laws in the US. Uh, Scott's going to give you a privacy law, a federal privacy law update hot off the presses from our partner Howard Waltzman in DC who has been tracking this behind the scenes. Um, and then we're going to talk about some practical tips we have uh, to prepare for the new law. And then finally, uh, some tips for those of you who are deal makers or working on deals, what you need to think about. All right, Scott, so tell us what we wanted to hear about this new law. Let's go to the next slide. Thanks, Dominique. I, before I jump into it, I want to say two quick things as an introduction. One, as most of you know, this is not the first state to pass one of these state laws, but in my mind it was probably the quickest. It's interesting how quickly this law was passed. I was talking to uh, my friend Scott here earlier. It was kind of one of the reasons I think is, is maybe it's a good excuse for our legislature here to give our companies maybe a, a head start, realizing that, hey, the privacy is here is here to is coming and it's here to stay we've got to get ahead of it and the second thing i want you to pay attention to as we're going through this is how actually business friendly the utah law is compared to some of the others so next slide so the first um so who did so the first thing i want to talk about is who does this law apply to i know many of you are thinking the first question is do i have to pay attention to this whole presentation <laughs> And so this, I'm gonna tell you right now. So if it applies to you, pay attention. If not, then you can tune out. But it's, first of all, it's entities that conduct business in Utah or target products and services to Utah residents. Um, you have an annual revenue of at least 25 million. And, I'm gonna come back to that word and, meet one of these two thresholds you can see up there. One is um, annually control or process personal data of 100,000 Utah consumers or derive 50% or, uh, or more of your gross revenue from the sale of personal data. The word I wanted to focus on is that word and. Most of the states that have passed laws so far just require those three, the A and B under three. If it's one of those two, it applies. Um, if you're in California, it's an or, it's 25 million or these other ones, but Utah's the one, it's unique, it has the and. You have to hit that 25 million in revenue plus meet one of the, the uh, items under three for it to apply. So in that regard, that's one element that makes it more business friendly. Yep. And I think, you know, on this 100,000, um, Monica, we were talking about it and on the way over, that that could include cookies and tracking data for those of you that are involved in digital marketing. So that would come out to about 274 um, Utah residents that hit your website per day. Per day, yeah. next slide. 
So we, I threw up there a couple of definitions in that first um, slide. One of those is consumers. That's very important to know what a consumer is, but maybe it's just as important to know what it isn't. A consumer, at least in Utah, is not an individual in their employment capacity, so it's HR data, and it's also not commercial or B2B data. So that's, both of those are excluded from the definition of consumer. And the other thing to note is what's personal data, and again, I think it's interesting to know what it's not. It's not de-identified data, it's not aggregated data, it's not publicly available information. Publicly available information, when I say that, it's information that is available from government sources or, interestingly, stuff that you would put on social media, stuff that you would put, put out on your own voluntarily, uh, put it into the public domain. So um, the question I get asked a lot by my clients is, what about de-identified data? Well, the Utah legislature has made it clear that de-identified data, and it's a high bar, but de-identified data is not covered. Next slide. So who is exempt? So we've talked about who this applies to. Well, who's exempt? Here's a, there's a whole list. This is a partial list of who the Utah law exempts from coverage. One of those that I, I wanted to focus, or two of them I wanted to focus on. One is healthcare organizations. I do a lot of work with medical device clients. So are they covered, are they not? Well, it, the, the way the law reads is it applies to, or it, I'm sorry, it's covered entities and business associates are exempt and PHI is exempt. So if you're a medical device, if you're a life sciences company and you collect this data, it applies. It doesn't apply to your PHI, but it applies to your other data. If you're a financial institution, you're exempt. So um, the one I wanted to highlight here is that medical device clients need to be pay attention. Okay, next slide. So when, so when do I need to get ready? How soon do I have to pay attention? Well, the Utah law comes into effect December 31st, 2023. So it's actually the latest to come into effect of any of the state laws that we've seen passed, but still that's only just about 18 months away. So you'll hear from us that now's the time to start getting prepared. You've got time, but now's the time to start getting prepared. So next slide. So what rights, so what does this law say? What, what rights does it give to consumers? Well, these are the rights, a list here, right to access and delete certain personal data. When I say certain personal data, here's another area where the Utah law is the most business friendly. It only applies to data that's provided by that consumer to the, well, we call it controller. The Utah law uses the GDPR um, verbiage of controller and processor, so only the, data provided by the data subject, um, the right to obtain a copy of your consumer data, the right to opt out of the collection and use of the personal data, and, there, and uh, the right to know what personal data business collects. Well, you can read that. So let's go to the next slide, Ryan. So what does this law require of businesses? Well, certainly you've got to be able to accommodate any of those requests, any of those rights that we um, saw that were, were provided to uh, consumers, you've got to be able to accommodate that. You certainly have to safeguard the data that you're provided, um, be able to comply with a consumer's request. One of the things that Dominique, you and I were talking about earlier today is um, the privacy laws are not just legal, but they're business issues too. And here's where it is, a business issue. You've got to set up your systems, your, um, your, comp your, your um, your program so that it can accommodate the requests coming from individuals. Exactly, there's gonna be some privacy engineering necessary to get through your data lakes and other things to be able to uh, respond to these requests, so building in time for that. Providing a clear privacy notice, I'm gonna to get to that in a second, and then you have contracts with processors that, that um, establish the detail of the processing. So you've, similar to what we've seen with GDPR, similar to what we've seen with the California law, you have these data processing agreements that are going to be required. One of the things that um, I think is one of the biggest mistakes that clients or misconceptions they have when I talk to them is they say to me, Scott, can you just give me a privacy notice and can you just give me a, a, a DPA or a data processing agreement? I'm good, right? Well, like we talked about, it's much more than that. Yeah, um, it's sort of like wrong because uh, the issue is is that everything that is said is you're basically making a UDAP 
rep representation and um, is subject to unfair business practices, deceptive practices. And so the FTC, some of the earlier uh, FTC enforcement actions uh, way back in 1999 focused on false representations in a privacy policy. So you could be creating a headache for yourself, not just under uh, Utah law, but elsewhere uh, with these representations unless they're absolutely accurate. So again, going back to what we were talking about, really knowing where your data is and what data you have so that you could accurately represent everything that Scott just outlined to you is really important. Perfect. Okay, next slide, Ryan. So we talked about privacy notices. What does it need to include? I think, Dominique, you summarized it really well. It's got to be accurate. There, I could erase all of that, and it's got to be accurate. But this is what the law says you've got to do. You've got to outline for people what, what uh, categories of personal data you process, the purposes of the processing, how the consumers can exercise their rights, um, and other things there. The things I didn't list, but are really interesting under the Utah law, is if you collect what's called sensitive data, that's things like um, religious affiliation, um, health information, it's, it's um, sexual orientation, these sorts of sensitive data. Then you've got to give people notice that you're collecting that and a right to opt out. The other thing is if you're selling this data, you've got to give people notice and a right to opt out in your privacy notice. So it's a very important document that you're going to need. So next slide, Ryan. So how will the UCPA be enforced? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's interesting, again, here's an area where um, the Utah law is much more business friendly than other states, and California in particular. There's no private right of action. I put that at the bottom, but it really could be the headline here. There's no private right of action in Utah for, instead, you've, if you've got a complaint, you go to, what, to the Division of Consumer Protection. If you go to the Division of Consumer Protection's website, you'll see a whole bunch of other areas that they regulate, but you put your, you file your complaint with that division, then they will recommend to the Attorney General that an action be taken, and it's actually the Attorney General that will enforce, the, uh, uh, go after the uh, violators take the enforcement action and impose the penalties. Um, the Attorney General will give you 30 days to cure. This is another very business friendly uh, aspect of the, of the law, that you'll have 30 days to cure. Penalties of 7,500 per violation. It's one thing that I didn't put up here that I think is very interesting is the Attorney General is going to be required to provide a report to the legislature in July of 2025. So if you do the math, December of 2023 to July of 2025 is a period of about 18 months by, in, in which to do this report. So I'm thinking the Attorney General is probably going to have to do something, take some enforcement action, otherwise it won't have much to report on. So I, I think something's going to happen. And so it's a time period that we all have to be concerned about making sure that we've got our ducks in a row in terms of privacy. So next slide. Oh, go ahead, Dominique. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I know with uh, California, our enforcement was starting with our AG on July 1st last year, and literally on July 1st, all of these notice of violation letters went out. So um, just, you maybe, I think your, um, your instincts are probably accurate. Okay. Yeah. So Dominique, I think we can learn a lot from other states, and in particular California. We haven't had a law. California has had a law. What can we learn from California as we head into this brave new world of having a privacy law? Well, hopefully it's a, a little smoother ride for you guys in Utah, and I'm going to point out some things that are more business friendly that uh, Scott already alluded to, but this wheel lays out uh, what rights California residents will have effective January 1st. 2023, let me just step back and say, California residents already have the California Consumer Privacy Act, which has been in effect for a couple of years. We have uh, two years of enforcement under our belts, as well as a lot of litigation that I'll talk about. So just like Utah, there is the first right, which is uh, basically um, businesses must create contracts and have certain 
key verbiage in their agreements whenever you're sharing information with another entity. So California divides up uh, the uh, Utah law uses a lot of the same language as GDPR and talks about processors um, and controllers. California uses a different terminology. They talk about businesses which are similar to controllers. They talk about service providers that are similar to processors and then they have this other category which are called contractors um, and those contractors are ones you might think of them as like uh, if you're going to co-sponsor an event and you're sharing information or sharing lists and then there's third parties that are just um, totally separate entities that you're sharing information with all of those relationships now require specific verbiage that's very prescriptive in the statute uh, the second thing is uh, just like in in utah california residents can uh, know, have, they have a right to know what data is being collected about them and, um, and they also have a, a right to know, to access the actual data that has been collected. And a little bit broader than um, Utah and, and GDPR in the EU, uh, California residents can have access not just to the data that they submitted to the company, but in our regs, um, California residents uh, in the California Privacy Rights Act, the new draft regs that just came out about 10 days ago talk about the right for Californians to request derived data. So anything that is attributed, something that you create as a company um, to maybe assign or, or derive certain indicators about your user base or your customers, uh, California residents will be able to know those inferences. Um, there's also a right to know what data was sold or disclosed for a um, business purpose or shared. I want to talk about the definition of sale, which is broader than um, Utah, so um, sale in Utah is in exchange for monetary value. In California, it's it, uh, making personal information available for valuable consideration. So this was a big, huge fight under CCPA, whether this incorporated cookies or not. Businesses took the position it didn't. Our California AG took the position uh, that it did and started bringing enforcement actions last summer. And, um, and to that point, I just want to <laughs> just talk about uh, the the AG's private uh, the AG's enforcement that's available in Utah at 7,500 per violation. We've had the occasion to defend California companies um, uh, related to cookie data, and you'd be surprised how quickly that can rack up. So if you have 100 California residents that visit your website per day, and there's 50 non-conform, you know, 50 cookies on the site for which you don't have the correct opt-outs. Well, the California um, AG is taking the position that it's 7,500. Uh, per non-conforming non cookie per day after that 30-day period. So it's a little over 18 million uh, per day that's getting racked up. So for publicly traded companies that created issues about <clears throat> needing to take that up to uh, the, the C-suite to get approval. Um, so Dominique, can I interrupt? So say that one more time. It's per day, per cookie. consumer, per cookie. Exactly. Exactly. That's a violation. That's a separate violation. Okay. So, I will just say that um, I just came from the Alliance of Attorney Generals in um, in Sun Valley, where a bunch of attorneys general from the uh, Western region were present, and they're all kind of getting together, and maybe not all agree and and enforced in the same way, but they're definitely talking to each other. So uh, this precedent in California is going to, just as I'm sharing with you, is going to be shared undoubtedly with your AG's office. Um, there's a right to, uh, and, and CPRA now talks about sharing, just because uh, certain companies, um, I, I was involved in negotiating the CPRA on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce, and this sharing language actually came from one of our tech uh, company clients that didn't want to talk about cookies as being sales, and so the terminology of sharing was um, was requested there. There's a right to opt out of the um, sharing of personal information. That's basically sharing is any cross-contextual advertising. Whenever you can track a user across multiple websites or mobile apps that the company does not own, California considers that a sharing. So consumers have a right to opt out of that. They have a right to limit the use of sensitive data, just like uh, you were talking about in Utah. There's a new right here, a right to correct data in California, which doesn't exist in Utah, but does exist in uh, Europe. This right was specifically put in to make California's uh, Consumer Privacy Act, the CPRA, align more with GDPR. So um, the 
the uh, proponent of the law, a guy named Alistair Mataggart. I had the opportunity to negotiate against him for about six weeks on behalf of the chamber, and he was just very direct, and he's also said it in a podcast and um, other things, webinars I've hosted him on, that he would like to see California eventually become considered an adequate territory for purposes of GDPR, and there's never been an adequate territory before. Be interesting to see whether your AG feels like doing the same thing, but that will certainly bring a lot of servers and business to whatever state gets an, a, an adequate de adequacy decision if that ever happens. So you're right, that right to correct, you're absolutely right. It, it's not in the Utah law, another reason why Utah's is More the friendly. most business friendly, Yeah. but the problem is, is for all those companies who have to comply with the Utah law, we probably also have to comply with the California law, so we can't ignore that right to correct. Exactly, like what we were talking about in the car on the way over here is that it's all based on your law and California's law is all based on where the consumer resides, not where the company is. So if you're collecting personal information about California residents or Utah residents, these laws purport to have extraterritorial effect, just like GDPR. Um, there's a deletion right, just like you guys have, and there's a right to have no retaliation. This means, and you have this right in Utah, meaning that, there, that if you don't give personal information or exercise any of these rights, other rights on the wheel, um, what California says is that, that California residents have a right to receive uh, products and services at the same price without a price or service differential. The only way to get around that is if there is a, what is, um, allowed a permissible financial incentive, which does require that the company have put a notice of financial incentive on their website and that they engage in evaluation of their data, actually valuing the data. Most companies have never done this before. Uh, we partner with um, a financial accounting firm that helps us do this and we do it under privilege, but it's been a conundrum and obviously a litigation risk. I'm looking uh, at my uh, partners here who litigate because even though it's supposed to be just the value of the data to the business, uh, we've seen plaintiffs bar already jumping on this to be able to say it's the value of the data, period. So um, just having to be very careful there. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. And B2B, and um, let me just back. B2B and human resources data does come into scope in California starting January 1st, 2023, and Utah excludes it. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so next slide. Um, just, I'll be really brief here because you guys don't have a private right of action, but I just want to give you a heads up in California. Uh, we saw the plaintiff's bar jump on our law and assert a private right of action even when they had no right to do so. So the law really limited the private right of action to negligent data breach. If you could show that there was a, um, a loss caused by an unauthorized access or exfiltration of data, then there could be a private right of action. Um, 230 putative with class actions later, there are about 60% of them that relate to data breach and the others on all of the areas, adequacy of privacy notices, uh, do not sell opt-outs, um, data rights requests, all these things that there were not supposed to be private rights of action for. Most, for, thankfully, we can go to the next slide, most of those cases that were filed in the early days got dismissed, so this is this you know, flux of cases at the beginning. Next slide. Um, and then we saw some spikes in, in 2021, but a lot of um, these cases in 2021 20, started to become more sober as uh, plaintiffs over and over again started um, hitting walls with our judges saying, no, these are not uh, data breach cases and you can't squeeze a cookie case um, and a tracking case and make it an unauthorized access or exfil exfiltration case. Next slide. Um, so we've already seen, this is a little bit of trend of what we're seeing in 2022, uh, the number of cases. In terms of the industries impacted, and the reason I raise this is that um, we've seen the plaintiff's bar, some of these 230 cases, we can go to the next slide, some of these 230 cases did not use the CCPA as an actual cause of action. They reference the CCPA as predicate acts to UDAP claims or uh, uh, tort claims, privacy tort claims, or California constitutional right to privacy claims. And I just wanted to point out the um, various jurisdictions where these cases have been filed. Just And what's interesting to me is it doesn't just limit itself to California. There's you know New Jersey and New York, Ohio, where other plaintiffs um, have filed lawsuits. Next slide. Um, we also see that the, the industries that are indicated, just like uh, Utah, financial services companies are supposed to be exempted, and so are health companies. But look at this slide. We're seeing 
uh, finance and fintech, some of the largest number of cases. We see medical device and health, um, quite healthcare really hit hard. So again, just the restrictions of the law will not stop the plaintiff's bar from trying to test, the, um, your, test these uh, theories. And Dominique, for our si Silicon Slopes, we see that software and cloud is the number two area right there. Exactly, so. software and cloud as well, and, and you see you know, critical infrastructure and other things, so just really uh, keeping an eye on this. Um, next slide. Uh, in terms of, I, I think I covered this already, um, they hit, plaintiffs hit a lot of uh, pleading challenges, but they're still now focusing in on the negligent data breach claims and continuing to bring a lot of them, and we do think that in January, come January 1st, 2023, when CPRA goes into effect, we just expect to see more, especially when HR and B2B data come into scope. Next slide. Um, these are just some common defenses that um, the defendants have used and that were successful. There was a provision in the CCPA, because the plaintiffs were bringing unfair competition claims even though our statute said that the CCPA could not be used as a predicate act for any other claim. Only one judge, Judge Coe, <laughs> uh, has allowed a case to make it past motion to dismiss in an area that was not supposed to be, um, that was not negligent data breach. Okay, next slide. So in terms of the notice of violations letters, if passed as prologue, I have no idea what your Utah Attorney General is gonna do, um, but if he is influenced at all by our Attorney General, A.G. Bonta. I'm sure they'll be talking. <laughs> yes, um, well if General Reyes is, is, is uh, influenced at all by General Bonta, you may see these letters going directly to the CEO of the company. Um, uh, they have the deadline laid out. Usually the letters, we white out, this is an actual letter that we received uh, for one client. These are confidential letters, so uh, we don't know everything that everyone has received, uh, but we did take a look at what we have received in our own office and then benchmarking with other defense counsel. Um, they usually don't just focus on one thing, but it's a plethora of things. Privacy notices, a bunch of ticky tacky things that are not adequately described in the privacy notice, the, the, what da data is being collected, what are the categories, whether the sharing uh, clients got hit with that, um, the, uh, whether there is adequate uh, discussion about whether there are cookies on the site, whether there's opt out, et cetera. A bunch of those in those letters. So just imagine four or five pages uh, that the client needs to address. And, it got, but the, and I just wanna talk about the 30 day period for just a sec because it's 30 days, but it goes to the CEO of the company. So by the time the CEO figures out what is CCPA, or in your case, the Utah law, uh, finally gets it to the general counsel, and then the general counsel figures out who's dealing with privacy within the, the company and so forth. We often get these letters with about two weeks left uh, and counting to deal with this. Our California AG has taken the position that they cannot extend the 30-day statutory period to cure. You can get as much time as you want to respond to the letter. I've gotten 60 days, 90 days, et cetera. But in terms, the, but the, the meter starts ticking um, in terms of the statutory uh, exposure for regulatory fines after 30 days. Okay, next slide. And, I th and it seems to me there are some of these violations that you can cure within 30 days and you've done it and then um, there's no, no problem. It's, it's kind of goes away, but some of them are just going to be so big, it's going to be hard to cure within the 30 days. But. So this is the thing that I just want to emphasize. There are two ways to put the kind of privacy program that's necessary that the H, uh, all the AGs we've talked about, and we'll get into this, really that we've dealt with around the world, just care about six things. To get out of these, these pickles, they usually want to see that there is some privacy program in place that complies with the six steps that they're looking for, and we'll talk about those later. There's two ways to get those six steps together. I mean, that means inventorying the data, doing a legal risk assessment, having mitigation steps in place, et cetera, vendor management, and so forth. Um, you can do it casually now with the time that you need, and I love that you have until December 2023 to work through this or you can do it under 30 days, house on fire, everyone has to drop everything they're doing within the company to address this issue and get it done within 30 days. I've done it both ways. For the client and for everyone, it is so much less stressful to do it without the barrel of the Attorney General's office looking at your changes and looking at the adequacy of the changes you've made so that there's a constant communication that you know, Scott would have to have uh, with, the, with the AG's office to say, is this okay if we do this, or you're gonna be comfortable with it because you've got 30 days to work with, but really is 14 
most of the time because of the way it bounces around in the company. Um, in terms of the enforcement trends from what we could see from the letters we've received and helped clients with, and then also we do sit in a group of uh, privacy chairs across a number of uh, law firms and 16 law firms, and we share information not about clients, but just about trends so that we can report this. But essentially, it's a third, a third, a third. And this is very consistent with what our AG did a report also uh, last July, and he identified um, about a third of the cases there that dealt with um, uh, privacy notices not being adequate, not accurately reflecting whether there's cookie uh, collection on the site, not accurately reflecting what information the company is collecting, like go around the site and see, oh, you're collecting this type of information, loyalty data, et cetera, but it's not re referenced in the privacy policy. Um, there's also things a lot related, about a third related to the do not sell issue in cookies on the website and also on mobile apps, and then another third uh, related to um, uh, consumer request and processing issues. So again, um, the AG's office is really going to be more f less focused on the data breach as much um, and more focused on uh, some of these other uh, compliance issues related to the statute. This is probably the most interesting slide, just seeing what the Attorney General is interested in. And to me, uh, I've got to assume that Utah is maybe going to be similar to this. I, I think it'll be, I, I think that they are going to use, if, if your Attorney General is like our Attorney General was, um, they're going to use this as a way to educate companies about all of the different provisions of the statute. When we looked back and mapped the enforcement orders that, uh, enforcement actions that we were aware of and the report with the actual regs and the statute, they hit every prong of the statute and they really wanna carry you through that. Um, so they wanna make sure that you have a compliance program. The other thing I thought was interesting, uh, be, notwithstanding the fact that GLBA um, data is, uh, and GLBA covered entities and data is supposed to be excluded and so is HIPAA and B2B, we found enforcement actions involving B2B companies Data, uh, companies that were covered by HIPAA and companies that were covered by GLBA because our AG was taking the position that marketing data, so the GLBA does not cover, um, they can cover consumers and customer relationships, but if you don't, ha if a random person that comes to your website that may not have any relationship, the AG's office is taking the position that is not covered under GLBA and so that marketing data can still be the subject of enforcement action and we ran into similar things under HIPAA. So just um, and the, you know, de-identified data is not PHI, and so therefore it comes within scope. So just stay attuned to that. Next slide. Okay, Scott. Well, th that's, thank you, Dominique. I, this slide to me is interesting because I think we've been talking all along that Utah is the most business friendly of these states that we've seen and much more business friendly than California. I sometimes hesitate to say that because I'm just guessing that if you're subject to one of them, you're going to be subject to multiple states. But here's a comparison of, of the different states we've seen, uh, where we've seen these state laws come into effect. You've got Connecticut, Utah, Colorado, Virginia, and California, of course. And we have two up there for California because you have the CCPA and the CPRA that you've talked about. Just looking at that slide, some highlights where you can see Utah is the most, there's no appeals process is one area. There's no private right of action. A couple of other states share that. The right to delete, of course, is limited to just the data provided by the data subject or the consumer. So in some of those areas where um, Utah is much more business friendly, we talked about the no right to correct, some of those things, but this is just a comparison. Next slide. This just shows you the dates that they're coming into effect, and of course, Utah's last of all of those. Next slide, please. Well, so now, Mark, you're going to ask me, what in the world is going on? Scott, what in the world is going on? <laughs> That's, we've got all these states putting forward their own uh, privacy legislation. This is the red states there are the ones where you've got signed um, legislation. The gray ones are where we're, we've got um, uh, inactive bills. The blue ones are where it's in committee. You know, every state's talking about, well, most, a lot of the states are talking about privacy legislation. Isn't it time that the federal government did something about this? And well, in my opinion, the answer is yes. It would make it so much easier. Next slide. So what's, what, is the, what is the federal government doing? Next slide. So just last week, 
we saw what we're, we're calling the, um, the, 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 um, the bilateral bill, um, uh, the biparty bill that's come out, it's been proposed. The, the issue, and I was just, you were saying, I was just talking to Howard Waltzman, one of our partners in Washington, D.C., who's very closely involved with this and behind the scenes, I was kind of asking Howard, what's going on with this? And the issue we've got is there's Senator Cantwell, who's very set in her ways and very wedded to one particular bill. She's put forward her own bill. And we've got these other three, um, the, the two at the House that are in, on committee that are responsible for this, the, and you've got um, Senator Wicker, who's also on the Commerce Committee with Senator Cantwell, who's got their own idea of how to do it. So we've got, and it's not just partisan politics, but there's actually bad blood between Senator Cantwell and these other senators and, and um, representatives that's making it very difficult to get a federal law passed. Well, what are the issues that's holding it back? Well, without getting into too much detail, there are really four things that they're talking about, one of which is certainly how we're going to do a private right of action. I think everybody's agreeing we're going to do a private right of action, but what does that look like? They're talking about um, pre-dispute arbitration. Can you um, opt out of class action lawsuits? Can you act, a, opt out of arbitration? Can you opt out of um, class arbitration? Talking about preemption, another big issue is to what degree will it preempt the state laws? And the final issue is Senator Cantwell seems very tied to this notion of what, what she calls a duty of loyalty is not just um, complying with the law with respect to your consumers, but are you going to impose some fuzzy duty of loyalty to the consumers who submit their data to you? So those are the four issues that are holding it up. I don't know that we're going to see something this year. I do think we'll see something at some point. When is It's not if, but when we're going to get a federal law in place. Um, and at that, I think we need one. I think the fact that we have this um, bipartisan bill, the fact that both parties are trying to put something forward means that there's a desire to get one, but it's just a matter of, of when, not if. Yep. I think so. it's very exciting to hear that they're talking and they're getting close, but unfortunately, for purposes of, you know, the practical and your prep, um, unfortunately, we don't have... <laughs> Good news to share that you know it's we are in a position to suspend the work at this point. Um, so we've just been telling clients to go ahead and get prepared for all these five bills. Um, I mean five laws that have gone into effect. So Dominic, I think we're running out of time. I want to hear from you though. How do we how do we comply? What do we need to do now to get ready for the Utah law and for all these other state laws and the federal law? So I just encourage you guys to, as you're organizing and getting ready with the letter of the law, if we go to the next slide, we talk about these um, sort of six phases of privacy compliance. And literally, I was just talking to the California AG's office defending another client with our team, our colleague, our other partner, Arson. Um, and they really just want to care about these six things, whether it's the FTC, the state AGs, uh, global regulators, they just want to see these three things. So first, they want the company to have appointed at least one person that is responsible for privacy and data security in the company. Does that mean that that has to be the person's sole responsibility? No. Does it mean that there needs to be an internal governance policy that says we have a privacy leader or we have a privacy task force and these are the tasks that they must engage in? Yes. Um, second, on the data inventory, even though California doesn't require an inventory and Utah doesn't require an inventory, it is required under uh, the EU General Data Protection Regulation under GDPR Article 30. But in order to do an accurate privacy notice along the lines that Scott was talking to you about and that California has enforced against, you really need to conduct a data inventory and uh, ask those questions that are responsive to the statute and, and have that down on paper. Third, they want to make sure that there has been a gap analysis, I mean a legal risk assessment done to determine what laws uh, your company is subject to and what your inventory says you are doing, and if there are any gaps there, what steps you've taken to either close those gaps or that at least it's on a work stream to be completed. And I can't emphasize this enough because when we get to the mitigation stage, like a lot of people say, why do we need a legal memo, a risk assessment um, at this point in time? 
for the very reason that Scott alluded to um, earlier about the privacy notice, they want to know that you have done a legal risk assessment so that you didn't just grab policies from anywhere, like SANS for security and privacy policies from your, your industry competitors' uh, website. They want to know that you have policies in place and procedures in place that are designed to mitigate the risks in your environment. Taking a step back, we're looking at you know, data breach costing our global economy last year $6.1 trillion. We're looking at NASDAQ and the, uh, what happened with the stock market, lost what, 1.3 trillion by March and we're what 52% down in a bear market. What triggered that was privacy. So what regulators wanna see is that you have done an assessment of what is uh, appropriate for your environment, not just grab something off the shelf. On phase four, for all of the sensitive data that um, that you were talking about, Scott, like the religious, uh, sexual pre preference, race, um, uh, medical, financial, location data, all that stuff, they want to know what have what additional steps in terms of an impact assessment have you taken to secure that data or to protect that data. So that impact assessment is a step they want to see. Um, so the Utah law doesn't require the data impact assessment, but I think we're recommending that people do that. Yes. So Utah doesn't require it. Um, from what we have seen, and in, in, in California, we now have this in our regs for CPRA, but we didn't have a risk assessment before. Still, uh, right now, in existing CCPA defense, when we go before a regulator, this showing that the client has done a risk assessment in phase three and, and phase four has done an impact assessment is it goes an incredibly long way in avoiding a 20-year consent decree and um, lots of fines. So I uh, can't emphasize putting that step in enough. And then phase five is all the other mitigation steps. So your internal governance, who's going to have access to the data, where is it going to be located, how is it going to be secured, that can all be in an in external governance policy, then um, the external privacy policy that is required by the statute, vendor management, uh, that is required in California, training of the employees, that's required of California for employees that have to deal with consumer requests. Um, and even though the training isn't required under Utah, just because all of these AGs are all getting together. I think this is just something, especially if you're going to need to comply with California, you should just conduct the training um, company-wide. And then um, uh, th for the vendor agreements, making sure that you have the verbiage that we talked about earlier that's going to be required in Utah and required in California and the other states. And then finally, just keeping an auditable record just like you do with any other uh, compliance so that you can go back to it if you have a new um, product, a new service offering, or annually uh, in, in the absence of any big changes. So I'm looking at this slide and realizing I'm on the front row and having a hard time seeing some of those small words. Oh, sorry. So we're going to make, Ryan, do we have, we'll have these slides available for people after so you can read that in a little more detail. But um, there's a lot to it and these six, this is really the core of what we ought to be doing for privacy compliance is right here. Yeah, I mean, this is really what, so we had the opportunity to look, This these six phases originally came from the French Data Protection Authority and to, for the six phases to, to comply with GDPR in 2017 on their website. When we compared it at that time with the FTC enforcement actions, and you look at the FTC enforced pri comprehensive privacy program or comprehensive data security program, sometimes they're 15, sometimes they're 11, but when you look at the steps, they're basically, those additional things are all phase five mitigation steps. So it's like, ah, this is basically the same thing. And you look around the globe, and being around um, these various investigations everywhere, uh, rolling out these six steps has taken many a regulator off of their hind legs and more reasonable with the client. Um, and that's why we just think of this as sort of a protective cloak uh, to put around the client. Again, we've done it quickly in 30 days and we've done it um, over time, which is the preferable way to do it. But there's, there are templates for all this stuff and uh, Scott has them and it's just better to get into a program that regulators, what I talk about is getting a program together that the most junior person in the regulator's office can understand versus the most senior. Because if you're not using the six phases, uh, the junior person's gonna kick it up and say, I see a problem. So if you can make it in the way that they're trained, 
it's just easier for everyone um, all the way around. I love this because it's a step by, it's a defined process. And it's so many times I think you look at privacy compliance and it's just so huge, so massive. I can't define it, I can't get my arms around it, and you don't start. But having something like this, just a roadmap, a check the box, it's, it's a start to finish roadmap to where you can get compliant, and that's, that's why I love it. So I think it's great. Um, Dominique, we've got more slides, but I'm wondering about what, we ought to just pause and take questions, and if no one has questions, we can do our last few slides. But I'm gonna pause, because we could be done right now, because that's the thing I wanted to make sure we shared was, this is how you get compliant, is follow these steps. These are the main things you need to do to, to prepare for the law. So we'll pause for questions. Yeah, Joe. What about uh, data that's critical for operations? I come from the utility industry, and we collect personal data that's critical to the operation of the grid or providing our service. Is, it, is that treated differently? It hasn't been exempted um, from the definition of personal information in California. Uh, it, now, it'll be interesting. We're now going through a regulatory season with CPRA. Uh, I haven't seen in this first round of regs, we just got 66 pages of regs and then another uh, 65 or 66 pages of um, explanation for why those regs were, uh, draft regs were put together. I haven't seen any carve out for critical infrastructure yet. Um, I think that um, the issue for operations, and you know, unfortunately we have Colonial Pipeline and some other things, but this is on the radar screen of a lot of regulators in general, critical infrastructure in particular because of um, you know, financial, medical, energy, uh, the critical nature that this has for the overall society. And so there's a, a big focus on behalf of regulators about what we're doing um, what, what we're doing to help those companies be compliant with the program. So I, I it'd be interesting, I don't know, I mean, you you know a little bit about uh, AG, or you know AG Reyes a little bit, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how, how he's gonna feel about, if you're talking about yeah. Sean Reyes, but yeah. I, I don't know how he's gonna feel about that, but maybe Joe does, but um, it'll be interesting to see. So. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> well, all right, we got, we got it. But what about the request to There are exceptions yeah. in California to those deletion requests, but for Utah. Yeah, we have similar exceptions okay. for if, if it's critical to perform the service, you, you, um, you, can keep on, you can keep the data, you don't have to delete it. And I can look at that with you. But yes, Utah has those exceptions. Yeah, so there's, you know, a, what, what we have is a, um, in California, and I think something basically will need to be created for all of the states, but we have a handbook that just sort of takes you through the defenses to the various requests, so the, sort of a playbook. Um, so, uh, and 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 I believe we do have it. I don't, I'm not sure if it's updated for Utah yet. So maybe Arson can work with you on that. But but basically, it's like a playbook. These are the defenses when you get a request that you can assert. And then for if it's not going to be too too burdensome, lots of times clients will just go ahead and comply with the request, but still preserve their defenses in doing so, because you don't want to just turn over the data um, without at least saying, this is not our obligation, but we are doing, you know, we're, we don't need to, blah, 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 but we're doing it because um, you've requested and, and, and we're doing it this one time, but so it doesn't create precedent and you're, and you're not um, putting yourself in a bad position for litigation. You're welcome. So Dominique, one question that Lauren asked me just the other day, and I, I keep hearing you talking about the California regs. Yeah. And so, well, what about the Utah regs? I'm sure someone's going to say, and, and in fact, Lauren asked me that the other day, what, about, what are the Utah regs coming out? What's going on? The Utah statute does not give the Attorney General rulemaking authority, so this is it. Wow. So we're not going to get regs. What we will get is that report that I was talking about earlier is mm -hmm. the AG is going to turn in a report to the to the um, legislature, but we won't, but no, we're not gonna get rules or regulations, so this is it. So interesting, because in California, our AG did a report, and it was basically a report of all the enforcement that he did, and mm -hmm. it is available on the California AG's website, um, uh, oag.ca.gov, and you can see that July enforcement report. From there, you can kind of glean 
um, because he, he did enforce in all the major areas of the regs. So maybe your attorney general does something like that where they're giving guidance by virtue of what they're reporting on the enforcement side. The other thing I think is really interesting in your law where loyalty is specifically um, exempted from the price discrimination. And when you say loyal, you mean like loyalty cards? Loyalty um, programs. Frequent flyer, pro that sort of thing? Exactly. Um, in California, they, um, they actually went after a number of companies that had some grocery stores and others that had loyalty programs that did not have notice of violation, no, notice of financial incentives on their website and had not valued their data. So it put into question, like, can we still do these loyalty programs? And you can, as long as you have the notice of, a notice of uh, financial incentive, but you guys don't have to do that, which right. is good. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. If you're not in the business of sharing or selling your consumer data, but you do have it stored somewhere on a cloud, do you still have to send out notifications to consumers that you have this data? Yes. You st and, and again, um, this depends. Remember, it, just because you're in Utah doesn't mean you're necessarily subject to the Utah law. And just because... Um, so it depends on where the consumers are, right? Which law, but if you're asking about the Utah law, there is a requirement for a privacy notice if you're subject to what information you collect, what you do with it. Same is true with California. Um, so even if you don't sell it, you still have this privacy notice requirement. And same in Connecticut and Virginia yeah, too. All the, yeah. Everybody's got a privacy notice requirement. So, so one of the things that your question um, strikes in my mind is, some of us might be thinking, well, we did my, I did a privacy notice for California, so I'm good, or I did a privacy notice for GDPR, so I'm good. The problem is, is we keep getting all these state laws that Mark's complaining about, and so we have to keep updating our privacy notice to make sure that it includes everything that, every time a new state law comes into effect, you've got to review that privacy notice, you've got to review your contracts to make sure they're um, up to date to cover all of the different laws. So, I have one follow yeah. Um, so, what if you have to store a consumer's address because your phone company and 911 laws say you have to have really accurate addresses? And when you send out that privacy notification, a customer comes back and says, I want you to remove my address. How do you deal with that? It's a conflict of regulation. Well, in California, there's an exemption for federal, state, um, f if it conflicts with federal, existing federal or state laws. So, uh, yeah, we, so we have similar exemptions, okay. and we can look at the specifics of that, but generally, like we were talking about before, if, if it's required for your business, if it's, if it's um, required by law, then you've got an exemption from that um, uh, delete request. Is the cloud you know, that transfer between, I mean, assuming the cloud is a third party, Amazon or Microsoft or Oracle, any of them, um, so that's like a service provider, which one is? Yeah, they'd be, depending on which law you're talking about, they're a service provider for California, they're gonna be a processor for Utah, for the GDPR or other states, but yes, so you will need a contract with AWS or Azure or whoever. The good news is, is Generally, I've found they're pretty up to speed, so they'll pretty much tell you what contract they're going to, yeah, they'd love to tell you what contract you're going to have in place with them, so. The one thing to kind of look out for, um, mostly they're service providers. Um, there's, there, some of them, if they're doing things like in the ad tech context, um, that, that are storing data on a cloud, and they might be, Running algorithm, uh, you know, running analytics to create to improve their own product, for example, um, that they're not going to provide to you, but just to be able to look at statistics um, that will improve an algorithm, for for example, um, or improve security by looking scanning the um, data packets and then being able to use AI to be able to identify certain things that will improve and enhance theirs. So if they say well, we can improve. Uh, we can improve our products. Sometimes the regulators consider that to be a third party in California, meaning that there's just specific contract language that needs to be there. And so just taking a look at the definitions of service provider in California, that means that you really can't 
do anything else with the data except store it at the request of the business. Um, anything, the, the way our regs are looking, any kind of enhancement or improvement of their own product, that's where they're gonna start thinking of the, the company as a third party. So it looks like we're just about out of time. Another question? Yeah, this is less of a compliance question, but I'm curious to know if you even have a sense for the consumer trend around this stuff, because it's a compliance question to the extent that consumers continue to accept all cookies and don't delete their data and continue to use browsers the way they do, but actually changes the company's strategy if you see a shift of consumers opting out of all that stuff and deleting data and, and, and browsers changing. Do you have a sense for where the trend is going consumer-wise? Consumer-wise, um, it, it's interesting. So last, uh, maybe 18 months ago, uh, there was a study done and nine out of 10 consumers um, reported that they felt that privacy was a fundamental human right. However, when it comes to opt-out in California, we've run some analytics um, with some of our vendors and less than 5% have actually opted out. Um, that's on the opt-out side. Now, there have been some business steps that have been taken um, within, you know, I think you guys are all familiar with Apple's uh, efforts and others. Uh, Google will be going in that direction as well, requiring opt-in for some third-party tracking. And there, where consumers are given the choice, do you want this app to track you, 85% said no. And so that is what took ad revenue down by 10 billion um, and then basically resulted in you know, it was a trillion, a little over a trillion dollars in market cap, and now I looked at it yesterday, it was at 475 billion for that one social network. So keeping in mind that, that, that if a company that you're dependent upon takes a privacy protective approach, which, you, which is coming with, um, by the time you get Chrome and Apple, uh, that's gonna be a big part of the um, app market and the browser market, and that's all anticipated to happen by 2023. Uh, it's it's just something to plan for um, because once that pop-up comes up to opt-in, that's where we see a big drop-off. Well, we're so grateful for all of you for coming to join us today. It's been fun for us to prepare and fun for us to present. We're grateful for you to be for being here, Ryan. I think our slides. We if you want to, we, I'm sure we're happy to share our slides. If um, give Ryan an email or. Um, We'll be disseminating them um, by the latest this afternoon. This afternoon. Great. So we'll, we'll share the slides if you're interested. And uh, thank you all for coming.